It's a terrific Thursday morning here on Whispering Hope Land. And this week, we've been looking at the lesson, A Life of Praise. And in the house with us to discuss today's lesson Thursday, we have Pastor the way north. And we're so happy that he's here with us. However, before we jump into today's lesson, we're going to ask him just to invite God's presence as we look at the lesson of what we have conquered. So welcome to Whispering Hope, Pastor Dawes, and please invite God's presence in your hearts. Thank you so much. Good morning to everyone. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father God, we are truly thankful to you for being an awesome God to us, for giving us not just life, physical life, but also you've given us spiritual life. Be with us and bless us as we enter a study time, a, a reflective time together. May the lessons learned be a means of joining us into a deeper connection with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So we want to begin by looking at our memory text for this week, which comes from Philippians 4.4. 4. And it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And so, Pastor Norris, Paul is asking us to rejoice always. What is your take on this text found in Philippians 4 and verse 4? I take it. I take the text. It's, we have to take the word for what it says. And yes, we read it in its context. But I think the message is clear that we should always rejoice in the Lord. Always. Those emphases are very important because any situation we're in, no matter the external challenges, if we're in the Lord, then we can rejoice. We can smile at the storm. We can trust him to the difficult times. So there's always reason for rejoicing once we're in the Lord. We may lose a loved one. It may be the worst time. The Bible says weeping endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So in everything, we give God thanks. It may not always look good to rejoice and you don't you may not be able to rejoice in front of everybody because they may not understand but god is able to see us through any part any situation amen you know we get to today's lesson that talks about jehoshaphat and we studied for today's lesson second chronicles 20 verse 1 to 30 and just in a summary here it is that some nations that God told Israel not to invade when they were on their way to Canaan were now ready to attack them. We have Mount Seir, Ammon, and Moab. And so they had this huge army. And as humans' perspective, they were sure to defeat Israel. But here is a leader, here is Jehoshaphat, who recognized that, hey, hey this is a problem bigger than us. And so he goes to God and to, you know, put before God some of the promises that he made. God, you have to stand by your name. And so you need to intervene. And we see in this situation how God intervenes in today's lesson. Any thoughts on this particular story found in Second Chronicles 21 to 30? And then we're going to jump into the questions for this Day. Yeah, it's really a profound passage of scripture because it deals with historical instructions from God and the obedience of the children of Israel. And I think because of their obedience, they ended up in a particular situation. And I know sometimes we often think obedience is going to always lead to a positive situation. But on the journey, sometimes terrible things to happen because we're obedient to God. The, the Ammonites and the Moabites, descendants of Lot, were also part of the promise to possess the land. And those from Mount Seir, who were the Edomites, were descendants of Esau. So these are all people who could have possessed the land and all could have become influencers of the gospel to the other nation. So God did tell them, no, you're all supposed to possess the land. And so don't destroy these people, even though, because they're your relatives. But notice what happened here. These same people came together, not one by one, but they formed a league. And they weren't mindful that they could have been destroyed by the Israelites. 
they were no longer grateful about it. They now wanted to destroy the Israelites. And so the obedience of the children of Israel in not destroying these nations turn around now and backfired at this part of the, the the story and so it gave jehoshaphat a grand opportunity to say listen these people are only here because we were obedient now they come to destroy us so you have an obligation to save us i just think it was, it's an amazing story and, and you know what i find more fascinating i know i jump in the head but the fact that his weapon of choice was not well, swords and shield and spears. But a choir, you know, I love music. So anytime I'm going to a rough spot, I go to the stories. It's among the favorites that I have. Because who would imagine that just a choir assembly, just singing praises to God, would get the omnipotent all involved and fight for us? And you know, as the lesson topic, it's a weapon that conquers, praising God in spite of. And so we get to our first question, Pastor knows. It says, people generally move into action to solve problems or respond to challenges relying on their carnal solution. And so the big question for you, why? Why is it so natural for us to want to respond carnally? I think it's natural um, because we are all carnal. We are born on the sin it's our natural inclination and um one has to therefore compartmentalize this question as to the the natural man or the spiritual man the spiritual man would want to consider what are his spiritual options in the midst of the challenge the carnal will only think that way if a spiritual man finds himself only thinking of carnal or natural solution then the spiritual man would would need to check himself a little bit so i think for us it may be one of the options but i think sooner than later we would come to the point as spiritual beings that we also have to consult god or we have to look at what is the best way forward from a spiritual perspective so yes it's part of the package for the spiritual person but the spiritual person would always want to consider what would God do or what can I do with God in this particular situation? So I wouldn't say it's it's natural for the spiritual person to make an, a carnal move because sin may be resident but not president for the spiritual person. Sin is resident and president for the for the sinful person but it's a little different for the spiritual person so i would say it's still one of in the package but for the spiritual even though it's considered we would always want to go towards the the spiritual solutions and i see you you you've used this again resident and president and i really like the rhyme you know somebody who play on words i really like that you're rhyming here and still <laughs> you know resident Final person, and you know, it becomes president. You know, it sup supersedes everything else. Right. And so, when we when we look, I, I like the fact that Jehoshaphat didn't see it necessary to get his troops together. His first approach was not the military, and I love that his first approach was to see God. And so we got our second. When you see a vast army approaching you, I don't know about you, Pastor. No, you're probably a nice guy. You don't have anybody bothering you. You don't have no army arrayed against you. You have muscles. They're showing me. <laughs> but when you see a vast army, people come together. They form confederacy to attack you. What is your natural response? What is it instinctive for you to do? You know, what is your reaction? And, you know, we're talking personally here. And I come on and on the spiritual, we've had that discussion. But instinctively, you know, there's a whole set of people plotting for your downfall. And people that maybe even consider your friends, people that you hold dear to you, all of a sudden now they're on the other side. You know, so you have this vast army. Defeat seems imminent. So, to you, question. What is your instinctive reaction to this vast army that's in front of you? 
Yeah, it goes back to the first question. I think it depends on where you are on your spiritual journey. Uh, I see the author trying to pull the natural out of the spiritual person. But I think as we mature, we learn to use the spiritual consistently and as our first resort. It doesn't mean there is no struggle, but it means this is my preferred position this is my this becomes second nature for me so if somebody does something to me i don't try to curse them back or pull a bad word out because that's no longer who i am so i i am struggling with the idea that the author is suggesting that our instinctive nature would supersede our spiritual i think it depends on the person's spiritual maturity because we do develop spiritual habits we do not wait to forgive someone after the act. We develop an attitude of forgiveness. We do not wait until someone does something wrong to think about being gracious. We develop these habits. That's why we do our devotions and our, our spiritual habits. So I think there's some merit to that on the Christian journey. And I think we would develop the instinct to respond from a spiritual perspective. And we see that with Elisha and the mighty army. You know, he didn't even think twice about the army that came when his servant looked out the window. And the servant asked, look at all these, what are we going to do? And he said, okay, Lord, open his eyes. And you would see. So he didn't fear, he didn't have a, an instinct to say, whoa, we need an army too. Because he was at a spiritually mature level beyond his servant. And I think that's what really matters. So instinctive depends on where you are on your level of spiritual maturity. And I agree, with you. Go ahead. I agree with you because somebody who has pretty much just been carnal and respond, you know, naturally, when placed in this position again, may go back to what they know. Right. But as you are maturing, then you start to tell Jesus, hey, this fight is not my fight. This is how I used to fight. I need you to fight this for me. And it has to do with where we are in our spiritual maturity so i agree with you because you know some of us truthfully uh past the nose we can be in the church for 40 50 years mm -hmm. but it does not necessarily mean that we're spiritually mature we've been that sitting in those pews too long and so if after all of these years your response is the carnal man it means that we have so well all of us you know we're not at the level of perfection yet but as we mature in Christ, there's some things that we have to let go. I'm learning that here because my mouth fast. I've been honest. My mouth fast, fast, fast. Somebody me, tell me something. Uh, and even without thinking, I'm, I am telling them my mind. But recently, right. I'm like, God is shutting me up. So Part of the God process. Let me give one example. I was at New Winchup's church. I think it was a, I had a, some program they had. And a member of the church, something happened that was displeasing. And she was upset. And she said to me, Pastor, that's about maybe three years ago, just before COVID. She said, Pastor, if it was the other me, I would have responded differently. Now, when I looked at her, I didn't even know she was upset. So I asked her, what do you mean the other you? She said, no, Pastor, you didn't know me before. She said, my natural response, right? That person would have had it, maybe physically too, right? So that's what I'm saying. As we mature, our natural instinct changes. It, it doesn't mean we don't have the temptation. It doesn't mean yeah. we don't struggle with it. But our natural tendency is going to grow with us as well in our spiritual journey. So we don't leave it at the side and pick that back up like that because we have a different journey and we would respond instinctively, you know, how God would want us to. All right, so we're getting to the second question, but I'm going to read Second Chronicles 20, 3 to 12, and then I'm going to ask the question. Now, Second Chronicles 20, 3 to 12 says, And Jehoshaphat feared, and set himself to seek the Lord, and proclaimed the fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Then... Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O oh Lord God of our fathers, are you not one heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nation and in your power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? 
are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary. In it, your name say, if disaster come upon us, so a judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple and cry out to you in our affliction and you will hear and save. And now, here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are, rewarding us by coming to the doors of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this multitude that is coming against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. And this is from the New King James. So that's a long reading I just did. So the question for you, Pastor. Uh -huh. From Jehoshaphat's response in 2 Chronicles 20, 3 to 12, what can we learn about dealing with overwhelming opposition? I think what is critical is that we we challenge God to be true to his word. I think that's the most important thing. We challenge God to be true to his word. And sometimes we don't challenge God. And I see here that Jehoshaphat used not just the history, but the context of the sanctuary that whatever the problem is it may not be an invasion but any major problem we have we have built a sanctuary here and the agreement we have with you is that when we come to this sanctuary we can ask for assistance to deal with any particular situation that may come our way and so the centrality of the sanctuary in the temple i found was very important as well in his response and reaction to what was happening around him so this struck a chord with me because sometimes we don't play the value of the church as though there's no covenant between us and god when we bless the church right i told my church and many some of them may be watching this video that we must dedicate the church uh going to church that is not dedicated is not the same i can go to church at home no matter what you call the place i can go on a tent but when you dedicate it there is something about that covenant you make with god and that place and i think joseph was emphasizing that we built a sanctuary here we made a covenant with you that whatever if thing affect us whether it's disease armies whatever dangers you will hear from heaven in this place and you will answer us and so we set our eyes on you so you challenge god and that's something that i found was very interesting in addition i look at his faith he knew god was going to respond when you ask god them kind of hard questions or you know you make that challenge to god then you leave him no choice but to respond because you're holding him to the fire you're saying god this is all you we could have killed them on our way out yes. because we had the manpower and all of that but you say don't trouble them they're family all of us supposed to inherit this land mm -hmm. and look what happened they turned one on us so you asked us to spare them but now they're not sparing us mm -hmm. and you know it's just instructive how god uses his investments to tell them hey you don't have to fight i'm going to fight for you and so the next question is just as just as interesting how can we develop a habit of turning to god first and this is for me too so personals when you're talking speak to sister challenger personally how can we develop a habit of turning to god first well i think it comes with habit it comes with one step at a time and as we learn to trust in god we learn to to accept his word and that's what we see in Joseph's story here that he actually believed that if this is god's word and this is god's will he's going to follow it it is now for god to respond to him favorably when we make that a habit in our lives it makes a difference in terms of what spiritual habits that we have in turning to god 
because this is something that we believe we have to believe it in the first place that if god says it he's going to do it he may not do it now but if he says it we're going to do it he's going to do it and by constantly relating to god that way we develop these spiritual habits of turning to god first no matter what the situation is now some people only turn to god first when things are good they say oh i'm gonna give god a thank offering i'm gonna thank the lord but when things are bad you know we doubt where is god but it, it really has to do with our spiritual maturity i think all of this lesson goes back to our spiritual maturity crucibles make us stronger or it breaks us and so when we are spiritually mature we learn to do that i i would say that i do that but i don't always like the response so sometimes i still am vexed at the end of the process it's a working on me type of situation that god is still working on me because something you go first and you still ain't get no good result so it's about what God wants to do in my life that really matters the most. You know, you went ahead, but I was going to ask you this question. I still go ask you. As a mm. pastor, I know you have people regularly saying what they want about you. Mm -hmm. And you deal with it, and it, it doesn't really have that great effect. But when it comes down to your family, your wife, your children, and sometimes membership can be a little bit hard mm -hmm. and critical of the, the family how you respond is it always a god first you got to go and let god fight this battle let's look at it from a personal perspective yeah um i don't know if i'm the right person to ask that question <laughs> <laughs> i never really had a lot of challenges with the in terms of persons critical in my no. space if they are if my daughter may say something you know i say okay that's part of the journey or my wife would say something. I remember one time a lady came. I had We were doing a revival, maybe about, what, 16 years ago at a particular church in Antigua. And the lady said, a pastor's wife must wear a hat. Must wear a hat. So she confronted my wife and was very persistent and insistent. So, you know, she was irate. She came to me. You see, this is why I didn't want to be a pastor's wife. You see, all that kind of thing. I tell you that before we get married, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> she was mad. So, I mean, I'm preaching the next night. So I found a way to get a lovely illustration in to show that <laughs> my my wife is my wife. I just love the way she, she comes to church without her hat and all that and so on. So I made it very clear without even making a direct confrontation with the person i just found a way within my sermon to celebrate who she is and to just talk about the fact that her hair is so beautiful you know i just love to touch it you know i just made, made it mine but i never had to really deal with an individual one-on-one -on -one. most of those uh, will let them slide but those in that that particular setting i, I really had to speak to it because of the level of this compliment my wife had. And so we would have studied Chronicles 21 to 30. And there's a lot in there for all of us. And so past the nose, I'm going to ask you to pull out some spiritual principles that we can apply today to our work, especially in times of stress and trials. I want for you to particularly because you know. I don't know what's happening, but yes, situation in our world is becoming so difficult that almost every time you look on, people are committing suicide. You know, we had a suicide earlier up in this month. We have so many different stories. So many people are, young people particularly, are dying. And so it seems as if our world is mourning. And so we're going back to Jehoshaphat and this whole story here. And so I just need you to pull up. What are some principles some spiritual principles that we can apply in our walk today with god when dealing with trials when dealing with stress even now i think the emphasis of the previous question is very critical in answering this putting god first when we're going through difficulties we have to put god first and a few things jumped out at this once joseph did that 
turned to God. He did it publicly. And what was amazing to me is that this wasn't a private prayer. He called the people together. He rallied them together as one united force. And he, as the leader, prayed to God and shared with God the burden of his heart. And I think this jumps out at me. Sometimes we have the closet moment, but there are other times when we have to have the community moment. We have to put our faith on the line. You know, in the closet, faith grows, but in the community, faith glows. We have to be able to, to, to demonstrate publicly that I'm a believer in God. And I think that's what Jehoshaphat shared. And, and what struck me also is that out of that, a prophet was born, right? From the priest, one of the priests, a prophet was born because of Jehoshaphat's faith. Because God was challenged and God knew that he had to bring a message to Jehoshaphat. So God raised up a prophet because of Jehoshaphat's faith. And also, I found that the, the whole aspect of God winning the victory, fighting the battle, what struck me is that it wasn't without the involvement of the people. Even, even though they were singing, they also had an army. The, the, the singers were in front of the army. And God knew where to set up the ambush, right? So it, it was just amazing for me that as I look at life itself, that once I put God first, once I challenge God, God will do things for me that he has never done before. And that's the, the, the main point that I'm getting out of Jehoshaphat's story. But it cannot just be a closet moment. It should also be a community moment. We must be willing to take what we develop in the closet to publicly declare that this God, I'm going to trust him with all of my heart. And when we get to that point, it's like we put God in a corner that he, he has to come back swinging. And that's what he did in this particular story. You know, just to add, the message that came from the prophet, I think his name is Jael or something like that. I hope I call it. But God sends a message to the Do not be afraid or dismayed. Mm -hmm. Because this of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, mm -hmm. but God's. And you know, so many times, I'm guilty of it a lot of times. Instead of going to God first, I pick up my gun, my spear, my shield, whatever weapon of choice, my words, and I'm ready to attack. And when we look at this story with Jehoshaphat, God is saying still to all of us, the battle is not yours. You know, and how can we really send that message out? to people who are experiencing real, I all crucibles are real. How do we get people to understand that this battle is not real? Yeah, it's an important question because God didn't in this moment stop the army from coming. He says they will surely come up, verse 16, tomorrow go down against them, they will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the book before the wilderness of Jeruel. So when we're going through these moments of difficulty, we have to be mindful that we go with God. I think that's what makes the real difference, that we're not in this battle alone. If we're fighting the battle alone, then we know victory is not assured. But when we're fighting with God, when we ask God for direction, for assistance, for power, for strategies then it really makes a difference how we fight the battle and i think this for me is my greatest challenge is not going to god but to understand the, the strategy that he has ahead of of me and i think that's sometimes the, the christian's greatest challenge we go to god but sometimes jesus says this kind come by prayer and fasting we only prayed but he said this one needs fasting too. So it's a journey as we understand how God works with us. I think that's the critical part of the journey that we have to be mind. We, we still need to grow on from time to time. You have to realize that the fast is called in the land. So everybody got involved in this whole move for God to 
answer. Yes, as you rightly said, Pastor Norris, it was a public conference. Everybody was there, children, adults, and Jehoshaphat prayed in their presence. And what I like really is in instructive for all of us is that the fact that even though God said that he was going to fight for them, they had to show up and you've said it. Yeah. But what I find even more instructive is the fact that Jehoshaphat began praising God for the battle of the earth. And to me, that is where we all need to get to the point that we understand, hey, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. So how do we tie in our faith with our experience? Last question. Please. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And um, that's that's why Joseph is such a prime example of faith that overcomes the, the, the challenges ahead because he was praising God, thanking God for who he is, what he will do before he has done it and i believe when we get to that point in our journey with god it really makes a difference how we face the challenges so for me the issue is can we get there how do we get there because we see the benefits in joseph's life that he can praise god in the in the midst of an in in incoming storm or doom to his life but he had that faith and trust in God that he's going to give him the victory. And so he can praise him in advance of the victory. And I think all of us need to get there. So let's practice it. Let's look at the moments in our lives, even now that we're going through, and call upon him to give us the faith that we need to be able to trust him, even in the midst of the storms of our lives. Amen. This discussion can go on all day, but we are out of time. A weapon that conquers, and this weapon is pleasing God. Our wounds were weighed. It seems as if it was eminent that they were going to lose. But what is impossible with man is always man's extremities is god's opportunities and we see this in the case of the husband that god showed up so guess what they were singing they were praising god moab turned against the ammonites and the ammonites turned against mount Seir. and at the end of the day they were all defeated and um, Second Chronicles 20, verse 1 to 30 says, At the end of the day, it took Jehoshaphat and his men about four days to recover all the bounty from war. So, this morning, we want to say to everybody, praising God is a sure weapon that wins, it conquers every situation. It changes our perspective. Let us know it's not about me anymore, it's about God. And so, whatever it is that you may be going through, whatever difficulty, God is calling you to climb higher, to praise Him in spite of the circumstances. And with this, we just want to wish everybody a happy Thursday, and God bless. See you tomorrow.